Long before Vietnam, Korea was the Cold War's frontline flashpoint in Asia and America's most visible commitment in the war on communism. I had always thought that the fighting had stopped, but I found out on the DMZ it didn't. They were still, they were still going at it. The DMZ was a war zone. I mean, there were regular incursions across that line uh, by the, the North Koreans, and people were getting killed. At the time that Resnick was there, the hazards to someone walking the line were very real. We were being attacked at night by North Koreans, throw hand grenades at us and so forth. The forage in the DMZ made it very difficult because the bad guys were coming within grenade range. You never know they were there. Until the grenade went off. This was what it was, engineer tape, a little wider that said, okay, you're on this side, you're on the south, if you're on that side, you're on the north. And that's all we had. And that's how you walked your patrols. When the North Koreans felt in a bad mood or they wanted to um, see if they could inflict any punishment, they would change it. They would take the tape and move it back or maybe even move it forward. And that way if they shot you, they could say, hey, he was on our side, he was here. He lived, slept, ate, and trained everything in the DMZ himself. During your A week, you'd be on ambush patrols. You'd run about 55 to 60 ambush patrols during that week. During B week, you'd man about six outposts, 24 hours a day, backed up with the reaction force. During C week, we'd train. Had one day off, then we'd start all over again. South Korea was a desperately poor country, struggling to rebuild after the devastation of war. For GIs, there was little variety during non-duty hours. Most invariably spent their time in local villages, where the entertainment was aimed at Americans with dollars to spend. They all had a, a girlfriend down in the ville, and these little ladies of the night would entertain them at any time, so their big thing was get off duty and get down to the village. You're gonna live good, you gotta live it up. And that's where all my money was. After being divorced, I tried to make up every minute and every second that I didn't spend with my wife. In Last Chance Village, across the river, there were more women than we had men in our entire battalion. There were more prostitutes. The commanding general, in our, in our welcoming speech from him, said, uh, look at the man on your left, now look at the man on your right. He says, those two men are going to have VD before they leave Korea. It was about right. That's what the VD rate was running. I had been serving on the stakeout posts for two weeks without any rest. And they decided to let us go to the village and have some fun. According to the company commander, it was only the stakeout NCO to go on pass. Dresnok needed to talk to me. He was in love with the young woman down in the ville. There was one girl very nice, good looking. and uh, just the average relations. I said, well, whatever it is, Dresnok, you can't go. I'm not gonna replace you. You've got these guys depending on you. Well, he gave me the hard lip, he's an officer. I just went down and made my own slip again, signed my uh, post sergeant's signature, forgery, and I went on pass. The next morning, about 7, the first sergeant came in and said, Dresnok was in the village last night. So I said, have Dresnok in my office at 8 o'clock. Dresnok comes in and, you know, he was a, a nice-looking big guy and he had a boyish grin. He looks at me and he says, you know, sir, you can't do anything to me. <laughs> I said, pardon me? He said, no, you can't touch me. He said, I had a pass. I said, Dresnok, be back here at 3 o'clock. We're going to read the charge sheets, and I fully intended to court-martial him. 
Hey, there's the orphan, the poor boy. You ain't shit. What am I? Am I a slave? To hell with this. I was fed up with my childhood. My marriage, my military life. Everything, I was finished. There's only one place to go. On August 15th at noon, in broad daylight when everybody was eating lunch, I hit the road. Yes, I was afraid. Am I gonna live or die? Everybody wants to live. If I say I did not lie, but at that time, life wasn't so precious. And when I stepped into the minefield and I seen it with my own eyes, I started sweating. I crossed over, looking for my new life. Best not come back. Go to hell. Son of a bitch is another let one round fly, but it wouldn't go that far no how. But it scared the shit out of him because he hit the ground. I got a call from Battle Group. They said there was a big guy in fatigue uniforms. He was carrying a shotgun and he was going along and he'd pick this up and he'd fire. And I said, Was he a real big guy? He said, Yeah. <laughs> 우리 군대가 응? 전투 진지에 침입할 때에 대한 명령을 내렸습니다. I walked at a very fast speed and I moved right on through. 그러면서 키 높은 그 세차밭으로 왼자가 우리 쪽으로 지금 오고 있다고 이렇게 예, 보고가 됐습니다. I got my rear end up the trail, I found the outpost for the Korean People's Army, and I followed him. <laughs> I was worried, why? Maybe someone would be trigger happy. Blindfolded me right then, tied me right then, and up the hill we went. Well, I figured he was, at some time, he was going to come back and he was going to claim that he was hunting and got on the wrong side of the tape and they captured him. So I thought, if he comes back with that lame excuse, I'm going to hang him. I'm, I'm going to court martial so that guy when he comes back. Well, how long has that been now? 43 years? They put me in a room, I don't know what it was. Couldn't see. I was there for one day, then I come to Pena. Of course, on the guard, at that stage I was a POW. I went into interrogation immediately. I hadn't been in South Korea long enough to 